Have you, uh, have all of you, looked at the, the promotion piece for this occasion, the uh, poster? Have you, have you seen that? Did you notice anything peculiar about it? There, the three of us are pictured on the top. Only one of us is in black and white, me. That means I'm the oldest person up here by far. But I am absolutely delighted to join my friends on this particular occasion because I think the topic is a great topic going from uh, film, uh, fiction to film. It's something we've all been involved in and we all had different experiences with it. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but I, I wanna tell you a story first about my family growing up. I'm the 11th of 12 children uh, in, from a little, little country community over in Northeast Georgia. I had seven older sisters. I went into counseling very early because of that. Uh, they were perfect older sisters, and I will have to tell you this. I, I really grew up in a remarkable family, an, an interesting group of people. My father was a farmer and a nurseryman. My mother was obviously a mother if she had 12 children. Uh, but the sisters were always perfect. They never made a mistake. I've always said my problem as a Southern writer is that I did not grow up in a dysfunctional family. And I didn't. And, and I, I will tell you the more hallmark of, of most all literature, but Southern literature in particular, is dysfunction. If you don't have dysfunction, you don't have a great topic. Well, in the little community of my childhood, in the Methodist Church that we attended, uh, the minister was, was a circuit rider, meaning he went one church on one Sunday and another church and another, etc., etc. So we got him once a month. He had this peculiar habit of calling on two people in the congregation to deliver the morning prayer. Uh, I suspect that was because he didn't get around the community a great deal and he didn't exactly know what was going on and who needed to be prayed over. And if the first person missed somebody, then the second person might remember it and say, you know, uh, dear God, uh, Sister Sarah's got the gout. And we need to pray for her, that sort of thing. One Sunday, he made the horrible mistake of calling on two of my sisters to deliver the morning prayer. They were not accustomed to speaking in public. Praying in public was beyond reason to them. But the family that I grew up in, there was an unspoken expectation from my parents that if someone expect, uh, shows some faith in you, you had an obligation to try. And I think it's one of the great lessons that I have uh, ever experienced, and I would suggest to you young people that you should listen to that. If somebody has faith in you, you have an obligation to try. Well, on this particular occasion, my two sisters, Jean and Nell, uh, realized that they were being called upon for a particular purpose that would have made the family proud. So they stood, knees knocking, mouth dry, and the preacher said, Jean, you start it. Nell, you finish it. They bowed their heads. And my sister Jean said, dear, dear God, take over Nell. <laughs> and my sister Nell said, Amen. What I'm about to say will not be as brief, nor will it be as profound, I promise you. Uh, I appear before you as something of an imposter because I became a writer without ever wanting to be a writer. And I, I, all these years later, I've been doing it now for literally 60 years. All these years later, I'm still not sure I want to be a writer because Part of that goes back to my family. Again, I have a brother who's 
the 18 months older than I, and he, his name is John Wesley K. He became a, a distinguished member of the Methodist clergy, taught at Young Harris College for many, many years, and uh, founded the Byron Herbert Reese Society over there, uh, a very proud undertaking. Uh, he always wanted to be the writer, and he, when we were young, that's what he announced, that he would be a writer when he grew up. And I remember on his 16th birthday, they purchased for him a manual typewriter, but it's, uh, the reason I tell you this is because I became the writer, stealing his birthright, but I never got a number two pencil out of my family either, you know. They paid no attention to the fact that that's what happened to me when it came along. But there is something in this. Uh, there's something about names that matter. Remember, John Wesley K., the founder of Methodism was John Wesley. My name is Terry Winter K. And I once asked my father, why did you name me Terry Winter? Where did you get this name? And he said, well, son, now remember, he was a nursery with trees and shrubbery and things like that. He said, son, son that, we took your name from an apple, the Terry Winter apple. I said, why? A tree? I'm named for a tree? He said, yeah, yes, you were. Now, I, I have to tell you that I've never known anyone named for a tree except for one person. There was a, an actress of sorts named Eucalyptus <laughs> out in California, but I think it's a story I can't tell here. <laughs> I prefer it all to you. Anyway, I said, you know, Daddy, Daddy, Terry Winter made an apple tree. I said, well, we don't sell the tree here on the nursery. Why not? He said, well, son, it died of the blight. <laughs> in other words, think about it. John Wesley, God. Oh, Terry Winter, rotten apple. And I do believe that all writers have some good rogue in them, you know. It's just it's something we have to say. I, uh, I worked for many years at the Atlanta Journal as a film and theater reviewer and essayist critic. I saw probably, I don't know, eight years in a row I reviewed, saw and reviewed about 300 movies a year. I got to know a lot of people in the business and I gained a little bit of a reputation in Atlanta at the time for having a, 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 some connection with the industry. People always coming to me saying, blah, 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 uh, can you get me a, an audience with so and so? Well, I couldn't do that at all. I wouldn't do it anyway. One, one day this guy came to me and he said, uh, now this is long before I wrote any fiction. He said, Terry, I, I'm looking for somebody to write a screenplay. And uh, I don't know how to do that. Fine. I said, well, Bill, his name was Bill McGay. I said, Bill. Uh, they're going to ask me the, the question that I have to have an answer. Are you, what are you paying? And he said, oh, well, I got $4,000. And I said, yeah, I know somebody that will write it. Me. I'll be happy to do it. He said, can you do this? And I said, sure I can. I know how to do this. You know? <laughs> Can't be that hard. I, I can do it. And uh, I had received a screenplay from the director Fielder Cook for a movie called A Big Hand for the Little Lady. I didn't know he was sitting in a shooting script. It was just a screenplay, you know, a shooting script. So I said, I, I could go do this. And I locked up in, a, in an apartment and I went outside on the deck and I took a legal pad and I wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight down. And I wrote beside those numbers every great scene I have ever viewed in a movie. You know, everything, you name it, uh, pulling the jailhouse thing off of the horses, and the jousting matches, etc. And all I did was check, check them off. I wrote a scene and checked it off, checked it off, checked it off. Wrote it in a week, turned it in, he thought it was wonderful. I knew it would never get made. Well, it did. It got made. Out of all the years of watching movies, it's the only movie I ever walked out of. I mean, I watched 10 minutes up and I thought, God, I cannot stand this. I have to get out of here. I could do it. It was terrible. But
But that was my first experience and since then. And then I got into the writing, the novels, in a very curious way. Didn't want to write novels at all. The, the late Pat Conroy and the late Jim Townsend, who was an Alabamian, uh, and the, the genius as an editor of magazines, they were having um, they were having cocktails one afternoon at a place in Atlanta, and they got to talking about why I refused to write fiction. And I, both of them had been my, I didn't want to do it, I just didn't want to. And Pat said, I know how to make him do it. And he got up and went to the telephone. At that time, he didn't have a cell, he went to the telephone. And he called his editor at Houghton Mifflin in Boston, a woman named Ann Mar Barrett, uh, who was, actually I didn't know this, uh, was the American editor for J.R.R. Tolkien. And <laughs> he told her he'd been reading, he'd read 150 pages of a manuscript his friend Terry Kay was working on. And he thought it was wonderful and they ought to see it. I, 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 he, uh, he forgot about it by the next morning that he had had his libations. Uh, anyway, I got a letter a few days later from Ann Barry begging me for this manuscript that Pat Conroy was, begging, was uh, raving about. Well, I, I didn't have a word. I didn't know what he was talking about or anything. I went to his house and I yelled at him and cursed him and you know, screamed, told him to get out of my life. I did not want to write fiction, just leave me alone. And he said, you know, Kay, you can do one of two things. You can tell her I lied, or you can write 150 pages, can't you? He knew what I would do because he knew my family. He knew that thing. If someone expresses faith in you, you have an obligation to try. And so I sat down in one month on a manual typewriter and wrote 150 pages. I did not correct the spelling. I didn't correct punctuation. I did it on the, you know, the carbon paper thing. And sent it off. Uh, oh, by the way, here's a question. And I want, I want you young people to, answer, to raise your hand if you can answer this. Do you know where the delete key is on a typewriter? <laughs> the delete key is the X key. You just say X, 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 that's all the word, and you put it the word. Anyway, so sent it on, knowing they would turn it down, and I did not care, didn't bother. To my great surprise and shock, I was offered a contract in a small advance to write a novel based on a little vignette in those 150 pages, and that became the first novel, The Year the Lights Came On. The writing led eventually to this book, the one that you have been discussing and study uh, to dance with a white dog. Now, it came about in a peculiar way, and I tell you this because don't think that all writers that you see are very in, in, uh, incredibly bright and, and uh, uh, observant of nature itself. We, we're dumb in many, many ways, you know, we're really dumb. My father died, and my great friend at Atlanta Magazine knew that we had been friends. He, uh, he, uh, begged me to write a story about my father, and I did. It was incredibly successful. It was picked up and, and used in other magazines uh, throughout the, the, for Father's Day kind of thing back in the day. And he and I were having lunch, and he was telling me how happy he was over the reception in, uh, of, the, of the story. And I said casually, you know, we, I probably should have written something about the white dog. And he said, what are you talking about? And I told him the story of the white dog. And he did what every good editor ought to do. He looked at me and cringed. He said, well, you're an idiot. You're just an idiot. That is the story. Why did you turn in this other thing? And then he started pushing me to write this story. And I didn't want to write it. I didn't want to write it. I, I could tell him I didn't want to. It was very personal, very painful. The story of the death of my mother and my father and the appearance of the strange dog that really did exist and really did show up. Uh, but I finally, finally, I was persuaded to do it. And I sat down and wrote a magazine piece and it ran. I got a letter, and this is showing you how things happen in your life, from a guy named Joe Beck, who was a lawyer in Atlanta and also a writer. And the letter said, Terry, 
This is a lovely story, but you've made a mistake. This is not a magazine piece. This is a novel. Now, believe me, people, you are fortunate if a word, a line, a moment strikes you as a writer and you know how true it is. I read that letter and I heard these words. He understood what they were thinking and saying. Old man that he is, what's to become of it? First thing, I went to the typewriter and I wrote that line. The minute I wrote that line, I knew the entire book. I knew everything in it the minute I wrote that line. I wrote that book in two months. Uh, the only thing I've ever written that I did not go back and rewrite. Uh, I didn't want to go back and rewrite it because it was so personal and so painful to put some of those memories, beautiful memories, but still painful in you know, the death of the parents. So I had uh, I had that experience. Uh, nobody in New York wanted the book. Everybody turned it down. I didn't trust my editor, I mean my agent in that, and questioned him about it, and he sent me letters from the people who'd rejected it, saying it's one of the most beautiful things they'd read, blah, 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 blah. Reminded me of my father, I remember. He said, I can't sell it. Why couldn't he sell it? It didn't have any dysfunction in it, and I can tell you why. Uh, he, uh, he then said, we've got a group in, in uh, Atlanta, Peachtree Publishers, that I want to send it to, and he did. And I got a call from the president saying, I'll send the contract out by cab if you will sign it this afternoon. And that's where it, it, it got. The one group I wanted was Al Donquin <laughs> to, to publish it, but they turned it down. That really surprised me. The best revenge I've ever had is every publisher that ever turned it down, when I saw them, in a Vincent, and moments later on, each one of them said the same thing. We made a mistake. That's a good thing. The publisher will tell you something like that. Uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the experience of the filming of To Dance with the White Dog. Uh, Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy. Jessica Tandy was one of the most regal people I've ever met. They did send me, they would not allow me to do the screenplay, though I begged to do it. And here's the reason, and I never think I've ever said this in public. Susan Cooper from England did it. Susan Cooper and Hume Cronin were very close. Uh, in fact, they married after Jessica Tandy died. Hume read the book and said, I'm going to win an Emmy with this. And he did. He won the Emmy on the day that Jessica Tandy died, uh, which was an interesting uh, thing to me. But he said this when I went down to, uh, the, to the filming down in America. He said, uh, Terry, you must understand we are not making a movie of your book. We are making a movie of the quintessential story in your book. Uh, that means a lot. He, he was making the core of the book. Frankly, what they did was reach in and pull out the love story, made a movie out of it. I think the book has more to do with, with the dignity of aging than it does a love story. I've read a love story in it, but I think it has a lot to do with the dignity of aging. I am, um, I'm rambling. I, I, I want to I make a comment that uh, Bob made here, I want to say that, talking about truth and writing. I've learned this in fiction. It is easier to tell the truth in fiction than it is in nonfiction. And the reason is because truth deserves and requires a certain elasticity to it. Because to fit, you know, the, everybody's thinking, you've got to have that. And uh, that has always fascinated me as a writer. But primarily, uh, I started my fascination with words as a reader. And to this day, I still believe that the reader is the most important 
uh, element in this thing of writing and being published and uh, acknowledged. I wrote this, and I'm going to read this uh, as a closing of my remarks. I wrote this many years ago. It is as close to the truth, my truth, about books, the magic of them, the beauty of them, etc., as I am able to express. And it's called While Reading. While reading, I have been a cowboy and an Indian with Zane Gray and Louis L'Amour, a Confederate soldier with Joseph Pennell and Philip Lee Williams, a pirate with Robert Louis Stevenson, an orphan with Charles Dickens, an eccentric with Flannery O'Connor, a Dust Bowl traveler with John Steinbeck. While reading, I have been a whaler with Herman Melville, a gold dreamer with Erskine Colwell, a small town barber with Wendell Berry, a runaway with Mark Twain, an old time gospel god with James Weldon Johnson. While reading, I have been a B-flat cornet player with William Price Fox, a battler of windmills with Miguel de Cervantes, an attendant in the House of Gentlemen with Kathy Eppenstall, a basketball player with Pat Conroy, a firefighter with Larry Brown, a defense attorney with John Grisham. While reading, I have touched the ocean's darkest depths and have walked on planets and solar systems beyond our sea. While reading, I have climbed mountains lost in clouds and walked the different road with Robert Frost and gazed at the little cat feet of fog with Carl Sandburg and danced to the language music of Byron Herbert Reese and Edgar Allan Poe and Mary Oliver. While reading, I have flown the Atlantic with Charles Lindbergh and pierced the call of space with John Glenn. While reading, I have stood at Gettysburg with Lincoln and in Montgomery with Martin Luther King, Jr. While reading, I have rejoiced with the still living of Dachau on the day of liberation, and I have seen the unspeakable sorrow of Hiroshima on the day of killing. While reading, I have sat at the feet of Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the other men of God and also those who would kill God, the insane, the madman, the bigot, the fanatics. While reading, I have been boy and man, girl and woman. I have been young and old. I have died and have been reborn. While reading, I have become people I cannot be, doing things I cannot do, and I do not know of another experience that could have given me such a life. Thank you.